Welcome, Dr. James Beckett, Sports Card Insights. I want to thank my sponsors, Top Spinini, Upper Deck, Heritage Auctions, Huggins and Scott Auctions, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, Burbank Sports Cards, ComC.com, and Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentication. So here's uh, an episode for your listening enjoyment. I bought a Heritage High Number box below original cost. I was also told Fanatics made so much of it. Dealers are actually making money selling at 40, which sounds incongruous. Then I went to Walmart the next week, and there were a couple t- tops. One 2023 Heritage One Blasters were like fifteen dollars each instead of twenty five. Yet I know this from going to the local stores. The middle to higher middle products are flying out the shelves, and they can't be restocked at reasonable prices. And I was just wondering. It's an interesting way to ten x. Because some products you're making too much of and some too little, apparently. We're in a situation with fanatics bringing packaged goods, commodities, high-powered sales techniques. When you have a product line like that, I think we're going to have to live with the fact that under fanatics, there's going to be a lot of experimentation. And they may not get it right immediately. And in, in the collectible world, and certainly with our company, we tried to print to demand or slightly less. I think Topps was like that. I don't think Fanatics is. They're testing the limits and they're going to be wrong. But it looks to me, Rich, like they're being wrong on the mass-produced, flagship, lower-end products. Maybe the mid-price they're getting right and the higher-priced, the more exclusive brands, maybe there's more discipline there. They certainly don't want to flood the market there. But still, I also think the 10X is not going to come from baseball. I don't even think it's going to come from sports. I think it's going to come from non-major sports because if they 10x baseball, I I just don't see that happening. In pricing, I don't think there are going to be 10 times as many baseball card collectors. I think there's going to be 10 times as many collectors. But in in five or 10 years, there may be twice as many baseball card collectors, but not 10 times as many. But there'll be 10 times as many collectors. And if there is more than double the number of collectors, a lot of them are going to come from other uh, demographics or geographies. But again, I think this is growing pains for fanatics thinking, how do we grow this business? When I was running a business, we grew plenty fast, but my goal was not to make mistakes. If we did make a mistake, admit it, move on. But I wasn't trying things that I thought had a 50-50 chance of being successful. I was more risk averse. Like I said, if they can make money at a much lower price, and that may not be net profits, but it might be gross profits. In other words, it might be above their cost, but they're not really making real profit from it, but they're not losing cash money. They're just not covering overhead or other uh, intangibles, but they're smart guys that figured out. You 10X and then more than 10X. You started as one employee. The minute you hit 10 employees, you 10X employees. Um, And and, and with peak employees, I believe 183, we obviously 10X a couple of times. And sales obviously 10x a couple times from the first magazine. You were risk averse and you went slow. Any regrets that you went too slow during the expansion process? I went too slow getting into the internet. I went too slow getting into grading and authentication. The biggest decision I made that was positive was to start other sport magazines, mainly basketball, football, and hockey. And others had some success for a while, but really those were the enduring ones. I was the beneficiary then of being able to hire you because we had enough of an output that we needed somebody like you. We needed football, we needed basketball, we needed hockey, but we needed all around sharp guys. If we just done baseball, we'd been much smaller. The challenge then of doing the other sports is you were doing books for the other sports once every two years. All of a sudden, you have to be keeping up with all the sports. One thing I tell people that's different for me at ComC than it was when I was at Beckett. When I was at Beckett, I had to know how the athletes were doing. Now I have to know who the athletes are so I can spell their names correctly, know what teams they're on, et cetera. I don't necessarily have to know if the Lakers score 150 points last night, how many points Anthony Davis and LeBron James have. That doesn't affect what I do. That's a good point. Basically. Because you and I, more so than the others, worked on the almanacs and the annual price guides. But those are more long tail efforts. The magazines were abridgments and only the key cards. That's why the analyst had to spend so much time talking to dealers to know what was hot uh, to the moment of publication or the deadlines. But when you and I were doing the almanacs, that was a labor heavily involved with the long tail. Again, if they're common, they still deserve to have their name spelled right. As I've said, basically, when you have empirical, actual data 
for a specific card, you use that. If you don't, you want to try to figure out, extrapolate or interpolate in whatever way you can. And some of the relationships that we noticed that were generally true, not always true, but almost always true, they held true in the magazines, which we were looking at every month. And when the annual book came up, we're saying that Mickey Mantle is more than Willie Mays. And it would be a great exception if it was the other way around. And whether that's two to one or whatever, like I said, we're trying to get as much data as we can. But in the absence of data, we're going to try to fill in the, the missing piece of the puzzle. It just can't be artificial intelligence, Nick Lee, without the intervention of a smart person, which was you or me. Not that there aren't other smart people, but we were tracking this stuff every year and trying to see, okay, this is the general rule. Does that still apply here? In lower price sets, the ratios are different than they are in the higher price sets. There's a premium, but it might be additive rather than multiplicative or exponential. I think you're right. Fanatics is struggling with some of the same things. Growth is great, but how you grow is the whole key to it. Fanatics wants everything. And I don't blame them. If it's your company, you want everything. But I think they're learning on the fly what's going to work and what's not going to work. And they have so many moving parts. We had a lot less moving parts than they do. They have athlete contracts. They have printing presses. They have to source out how much raw material, so to speak, to create the sets. They have to distribute them. All that costs money and all that is a huge circle. You grow by having more products or having more customers. The simplest kind of growth, which I hope they don't totally rely on, which is the precipitation of the junk wax era, is selling more of the same stuff to the same people. You need new products, which I think they're experimenting with, line extensions, and then they've got to broaden their reach. They need some new customers. They went into Costco last year. It was a lot of the same photos as the base cards, but it was a different numbered set when they had separate insert cards for that. You figure if you're going to Costco or Sam's Club or those type of places, that you might get a different audience there too. That's more of the bulk audience we were talking about. But the more audiences you can reach, too, the better off you are. We're a lot more fragmented than we were in the 90s, too. There's a lot more TV stations. Print media is certainly way down. How many podcasts are there? Basically, when we were starting and had the company, I basically felt, build it and they will come. We wanted to put out a great product that people would, by word of mouth, because we didn't do a lot of marketing, they'd say, this is a good product. I'm going to recommend to my friends. We did some marketing promotion to dealers, but we wanted it to be there so that people could find it. One of my digital savvy friends says, no, in the digital world, if they come, we will build it so that you don't do something and then try to figure out how to sell it. You figure out what people are asking for and then you build it. But what Fanatics is doing is a third thing, and that is build it and don't wait for them to come to you. Get it in the places where the people are. So take it to the people. And that's why these other outlets, the Costco's and uh, their international distribution, go where you can get some new customers. Now, we probably did that. We have international distribution. We had a huge number of of hobby shops and we had all the Walmarts. But that's the point. You already got the product. The complexity is not printing up more or making more of the same product. The complexity is additional products and trying to translate them or uh, reach markets that don't speak the same figuratively or literally. So I think Fanatics is going to experiment and do all that stuff. And the 10X is going to come from ways that are not contemplated now even. I I think you're right. You hit on something really key there. If you can go to where people are, there's very few things. The Super Bowl, Taylor Swift, I know she was part of the Super Bowl, but there's very few things that right now Almost everybody in America knows the presidential election in a couple months. It's being more fragmented. You can't just sit and say, I'm going to send my cards only to the hobby shops or only to retail or only to Costco. You've got to experiment and try all these new places and keep coming up with reasons to get people interested, both on the super high level, like the Bronny and LeBron card, the dual sign card that went for 114 k and pulled at a card shop, not for a breaker. And the cards where if a person buys a box for $100, they feel good. And I know that back in the day, the guys we had that went from Beckett to Panini, and most of them are now at at Fanatics, they were really good at, we'll call the $60, $80, $100 box. Even if you didn't get the great hit, you felt good after getting one of those boxes. You felt like you got your value. I've never heard it discussed this way, 
But back in the early 70s, when I was getting really seriously into collecting, the whole rage of the 50s, it was obligatory that you get your 50s tops and Bowman sets. But what people really were excited about were the regional because they were uh, more difficult. I've always thought about regionals being a, a um, kind of a, a scarce quest challenge because 20 years later, that's what it was. But think about it the other way is that these regionals were part of this market expansion. If you're a kid and you're in the tri-state area in Ohio, let's say, and your, your mom goes to get a package of hot dogs and it's Con's Wieners. Con's Wieners had a long run. And who's to say that people, their first card was a Con's Wiener card in the late 50s, as opposed to being a Topps card? I don't know that, but I just think cards were out there in the supermarket, other places where you didn't normally see them. And so maybe instead of regionals in the 50s, the Stall Myers, the Rodeo Meats, all those things being the final quest, maybe they were an entry point for some people. And so maybe Fanatics needs to be thinking about not regional in the sense of making special products for special markets instead of just trying to take the top's flagship and put it lots of different places, but making some more unusual items that bring people in a curious way. That's been done a lot in the past, the Topps team sets that, that are available at all the retail stores. And when you're thinking about that, we're in the Dallas area. I wonder if anybody began their collection back in 1960, 61, by those old 7-Eleven cards, which are really tough nowadays. They're tough. But if, you see, if somebody has them, they usually have a good stack of them. But like you're saying, that's not a Topps card produced by 7-Eleven. They're inferior. They actually make tops look good. Now, I'm just wondering whether it's Fanatics or Panini or Upper Deck, if there can't be some other commercial product tie-ins that are food-related or other kinds of things. They don't scream tops. They scream, hey, these are collectible, and they're only available in this country or this part of America, the Southeast or the Northwest. Or Canada. Would we really want to bring back the Mike Schechter cards without the logos? I know, uh, but I'm saying in expanding the market of which uh, Fanatics will have the, the lion's share with all the major licenses. If they were to be very cooperative with some of these corporate types who say, we'd like to uh, piggyback, get under your license, but we'd like to do our own card set. Will you let us do that? It might expand the market and it wouldn't look like Fanatics has taken over the world. It's allowing others to help expand the market. I know Upper Deck has had great success with the Tim Horton sets. Exactly. That'd be another good example. Tim Horton, to me, is more prominent than Upper Deck in that co-brand. Just like McDonald's has done uh, things over the years with baseball and also with hockey. To 10x the market, I'm wondering if these uh, existing car companies couldn't be highly cooperative with uh, other major corporations that would like to use card-like elements for their promotional ability. I'm going to steal something from our owner here, Tim Getz. I was not there when my great nephew opened his boxes of cards. He pulled a base Corey Seeker card. My niece then sent a photo of him opening the card with pure joy on his face. It's not that it's worth money, but he had pure joy on his face getting the local hero. I know money's always been involved, but are we missing some of the fun? No, we but, want a 10x, but do we, if we get people to have fun, will that make it a more naturally 10x experience for people? Wait a second, I have fun doing this. I'm not worried if I'm spending $10 a week. This is fun, and if I get some of my money back, great. And if not, it's disposable income. I, I think over time, we are encouraging people to think of this as a monetizing, sustainable, profitable hobby. And it, it really can be, but it shouldn't be based on blind luck that you buy it and then you immediately sell it for more. There ought to be some organizational aspect or some trading aspect or some knowledge of this player's on the come, this player's falling out of favor. Now all they want to talk about is buy sports when they're out of season. That's too simplistic. It does work sometimes, but it doesn't work always. 